Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and bearing witness to these important stories. Um, I first would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, Spectrum Discovery Area, UM Environmental Studies Program, Families for a Livable Climate, with their Montana Climate Stories Project. We'd like to give a special thanks to MCAT, KFGM, and Molly Galusha, thank you. <laughs> this presentation is being recorded by Missoula Access Television as part of a media assistance grant donated by MCAT. Thank you to Molly for donating the compostable to uh, silverware. Thank you so much. It is my great honor to introduce our first speaker. Justin Engel is a professor of marketing at the University of Montana and the Poe Family Distinguished Fellow. Justin's academic research focuses on how people express their identities through consumption behaviors. Justin's research has recently been published in the Journal of Marketing, the Journal of uh, Consumer Research, and the Journal of Consumer Psychology. His work has been covered by media outlets such as Sport, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, and the Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, and the Wall Street Journal. It's not amazing. Justin is also the creator and host of the College of Business podcast and Montana public radio program, A New Angle. In 2021, he released Fireline, a six-part podcast about wildfire means to the West, our planet, and our way of life. In 2023, he co-authored the book, This is Wildfire, Fire, How to Protect Your Home, Your Community, and Yourself in the Age of Heat, with Nick Mott. When not teaching and doing research, he's chasing his two daughters around. Justin is a competitive endurance athlete and a product tester for Patagonia. Please welcome Justin to the stage. Thanks everybody, thanks for coming out. Thank you for the invitation to, uh, to speak to you all tonight. Uh, some of you might be wondering, like, why on earth is a marketing professor thinking about wildfire? Why on earth is a marketing professor here talking to you about stories of resilience, stories in general? Maybe you're asking your question, that question to yourself. Maybe you're not. I, I certainly ask that question of myself frequently, and the story I'm going to sort of share tonight is, is perhaps... Um, I don't know that I have the best answer yet, but I'm moving closer to it. So tonight will be my best attempt thus. Well, I don't know if it'd be my best attempt thus far. But it'll be an attempt, and we'll see how it goes. Anyway, uh, Nate, we have one uh, slide video to sort of sh tell you a little bit about Fireline, and um, this Raging is kind of wildfires. This is kind of the midpoint of the story. We'll take it from there. Raging wildfires have scorched a record number of the acres and killed at least to climb from people. those devastating wildfires. Last year, wildfires scorched a landmass nearly five times the size of Yellowstone National Park. It was the largest area burned since reliable records began. Fires are getting bigger and hotter and more devastating than ever before. But what all that fire means and what to do about it depends on who you ask. The experience of a forest taking fire is really something. It's not only a gift to us, but it's more, more of a gift to the land. There will always be fear of fire, I, I know that, and I don't pretend there won't be, but in certain situations, there shouldn't be. I'm Justin Angle, and for the last couple years, I've been talking to scientists, historians, and firefighters themselves to hear their stories. You owe it to the guys that died. I wanted to figure out, how did we get here? We're going to knock fire out of the landscape. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. It was a crazy ambition. And where do we go? It just, knowledge is, is freaking power. I'll talk about it in a calm way, but this is me hitting the panic button. Am I making any difference here with the science? <laughs> That's what I wonder sometimes. This is Fireline a six-part podcast series from Montana Public Radio and the University of Montana College of Business about what wildfire means for the West, our planet, and our way of life.
coming March 9th. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Anyway, so as I said, that was kind of the midpoint of the story. So I started um, as a professor at the University of Montana College of Business in 2012. Um, and my background, my, my graduate studies are largely in social psychology. I was interested in how people make decisions and how they form attitudes and shape their identity some ways, sometimes in ways outside of their own awareness. Uh, and how does that lead to marketing? Well, there's sort of a pragmatic approach to that. I um, had a business background as an undergrad. I studied business and then worked in business for a number of years uh, until I developed this interest in social psychology. And then as a graduate student, realized that getting a job as a marketing professor, I could still study social psych, but also um, find a job. And that job was likely to pay a little bit more than a psych professor job. It just seemed like it made some pragmatic sense. So pursued that, got the job here. And over the course of the 12 years I've been doing that, I've grown more and more nauseated with marketing. Um, it started, as, you know, my study of it started as an interesting way to think about how people make decisions and how they carry themselves in the world. And um, my teaching started to devolve into helping students get jobs in fields where they'd be, you know, optimizing the customer experience, optimizing a search engine, helping people run campaigns uh, using the data available on Facebook. And I grew really uncomfortable with that. And as a result, I've sort of moved my teaching further and further away from that to the point now where I teach an introductory course at our college that um, that is just designed to teach students how to go to college, really, and take advantage of the opportunity in front of them. Um, at the same time, as I was growing uh, disillusioned in my academic discipline, I started getting interested in people's stories and learning that in this community there are some amazing stories. There's uh, uh, such a rich... Um, diversity of story in this community. And that led me to launch an interview program that's now on Montana Public Radio, as Ren mentioned, A New Angle. And that just gave me the opportunity to hear story after story after story and learn so much about people, how they've approached life, and how they've moved through their own experiences, how they've found ways to be resilient. I mean, think of how much has changed not only in our world, but here in, in Western Montana in the last 10 years, it's been pretty remarkable and to learn and sort of track how people have adapted to that in the six years that I've been doing this program has been pretty wonderful. Within that climate and uh, how we sort of deal with the climate crisis has always been um, top of mind. And I certainly feel a fair amount of guilt uh, participating in the world of consumerism in the role I have as a business educator. And I've been trying to, I had been trying to think of ways to wade in to doing some good toward helping us address the climate crisis. And uh, realizing that there is some ability that I've developed to be able to translate some of the amazing work happening around us. Here in Missoula, we're at an epicenter for wildfire. There's world-class fire science happening. There's world-class social science in the fire space happening. There are tip of the spear firefighters, policymakers. So much of the, you know, the, the, the highest level work in the fire space is happening right here. But it seemed to me that not a lot of people understood how it all tied together, and um, how these great people sort of were forming a a set of strategies that can actually help us address this fire, wildfire crisis. I mean, this is one of the pieces of climate change that we actually have some agency to improve. And we can make a real difference in, in how our society chooses to, uh, to adapt to a world with more fire. And so that general curiosity led me down this path of developing this podcast. And this podcast is, is a hugely different project than my interview show. And I kind of, I think ignorance in this type of storytelling and what it takes is the only reason I got into it because I had no idea how big a project, a narrative podcast with you know, interviews and original score and scenes and characters and all these dimensions that I sort of took for granted 
how big a lift it was. And as I started to get into it, I quickly realized that I don't have the tools as a you know, business professor, as a social, social scientist. Like that's not the sort of storytelling that I have any training in. Like this is a real journalistic enterprise. So teamed up with Nick Mott, who's a phenomenal journalist here in, in Montana, lives in, lives in Livingston now. If you've listened to any of the, the real premier podcasts produced in Montana, chances are Nick's fingerprints are all over them. Um, and he's become a wonderful friend. We also had a young man by the name of Victor Iveas. He was a student in the journalism program at UM at the time. And it was during COVID. So the three of us just sort of developed this Zoom routine um, of like, okay, we, we got to build this thing. And how do you build it? And Nick was the one that sort of taught us. Like, you do it with characters. You do it with narrative. You do it with scenes. And these were all new skills. So Fireline, and, and I don't know if any of you have listened to it, but as, if, if you do have occasion to listen to it, you'll find that our aim there is to tell stories within stories within stories. So there's six parts. It forms a narrative arc from, you know, what, what, you know the moment we're in now, how we got here, how what we're doing is not working, to news you can use, right? And then within that, we had to use characters to sort of tell that, each one of those stories, and to get folks to listen. And in a podcast form, you know, characters are really important. Scenes are really important. And, and you can't be as descriptive. I mean, oftentimes when you're reading about climate, talking to a scientist, you get a lot of facts, right? You get acres burned, homes lost, um, degrees that the climate has changed, all, all of this descriptive stuff and, and science and, and information, the information model, right? But the information model is not that persuasive, right? We're learning that more information about what's happening with the climate is not changing our ways. And so I think stories, uh, or stories in general, but stories of human impact and how people are not only committing their lives to making this world better, but also experiencing the, the changes that the world is, is putting upon many of or well, it's circular, right? Like, that's a story within the story of the podcast. Like, we, there's, um, you know, a thread in anthropology. We talked to an anthropologist who developed this theory around our, um, the moment we as humans were able to start controlling fire was the moment we became human. It sort of set in motion the ability to cook food, which set in motion the ability to ingest more calories and power a larger brain, and our brains grew. And so the very idea that controlling fire is what made us human, you fast forward two million years, and now our obsession with fire has put our planet in peril, right? So like narrative kind of hooks like that are, story, are the sorts of stories that are within the wildfire story. The, the, the podcast did um, really well. It was well received. I think it, it sort of hit a moment um, in the popular. There was a need for it. There was a need for that sort of um, understanding. And that led to this wonderful opportunity to write a book. And I'd never written a book before. Um, Nick had never written a book before. And we both sort of felt like there's no way we can do this. Um, but if we are together in it, maybe we can pull it off. Uh, a publisher from Bloomsbury had listened to the podcast and reached out and said, had you guys ever thought of doing a book? And with so many amazing writers in this community and many of them struggling to get their work published, I feel um, sort of sheepishly guilty about how this book opportunity happened in reverse. Um, my understanding is it's typically not that easy, so I'm grateful for that. But anyway, writing a book about wildfire is a whole different enterprise right? Different medium and a different set of tools, a different style of writing. You can use information in different ways. Characters play less of a role in a book like this. Scenes play less of a role. Um, you can use a little bit more information, but uh, it was a different set of skills that really opened me up to new opportunities. Um, basically, the idea being is that there are things we can do with wildfire to make the situation better. We can manage our lands differently. We can build our homes in different places and build them smarter with different materials. 
we can do this at a community level. We can change our zoning re regulations. We can change how we build and where we build. And these are all things that um, some take more money than others. Some are harder to enact from a policy standpoint than others. But at the very least, like all of us can, can play a role. We can all take actions, whether it's cleaning our gutters, which makes our, ho our homes much more safe to being burned, um, to advocating for change at a, at a national level. So anyway, I'm coming up against time, but as I close, I just kind of want to read you a little passage from the book that I think um, sums up sort of our approach to this work. One day this summer, a lightning bolt will strike an old ponderosa pine, or a gust of wind will send a power line to the ground, or a car will light up some vegetation on an overgrown double track road. A train will set off, send off a spark. The burning entrails of a, of a firework will rain down on a juniper. Someone will take a lighter to a blade of grass. There's no way to eliminate fire, but we can mitigate its severity and how it affects us. Doing that requires thinking long term. It requires changing ourselves and our homes and engaging with the world around us and our neighbors in ways we may not have considered before. Fire season is at least 80 days longer than it was 30 years ago. By the end of the century, experts anticipate extreme fire events to rise by 50% across the world. That means flames will burn bigger in bigger areas during more parts of the year, from temperate grasslands to tropical savanna to tundra in Australia, Greece, the Amazon, Indonesia, the Arctic, and beyond. We've mobilized an army to fight a never-ending war on fire, Yet we build deeper into areas ready to go up in flames. And we keep ramping up our burning of fossil fuels, contributing to, a warming, to the warming of our planet and making conditions ripe for bigger, more extreme blazes. We're at a precarious moment for wildfire in the United States. We can keep thinking about these conflagrations in the same way, or we can change course. The question driving this book is, how can we recognize both truths of wildfire? It threatens and destroys so much of what we love, our homes, livelihoods, mental state, our very ability to breathe. But it's also a process that's completely natural. It rejuvenates forests and ecosystems. Fire has burned across the earth longer than our species has walked the planet. How do we live in a world with fire? How do we manage it? And how do we manage ourselves? Anyway, generally this is a, a story that uh, we try to make hopeful and empowering, and I think in a world where climate seems um, to bring us doom and gloom on a regular basis, wildfire is an area where we can actually make some difference. And to me, that's an area where um, investing some energy, the, the energy and few abilities that I have uh, seem like they can move the needle. So yeah, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Jess. I wanted to let everyone know that if you have questions for any of our speakers, we're going to have a very lovely reception that we have food in, and you are welcome to ask them those questions as you are thinking about them. Our next speaker is going to be Priya, and I would love to tell you a little bit about them. Priya is a writer and multimedia artist based here in Missoula. Their work centers around decolonization and collective action and is inspired by queer and trans liberation movements, the ecosystem of the high Rockies and of Northern India and their grandmother's garden. They are receiving their master's in environmental studies from the University of Montana and they uh, and, um, and are the graphic artists Iveda. Thank you so much, Priya. Yeah, thanks, Ren. Hi, how are you? Good. Cool. Me too. Um, so Robin asked me to write a poem about fire. And so this is called Untitled Poem About Fire. I have a confession to make. I love the smell of wildfire. It makes me homesick. I grew up in the Mountain West, and every summer is smokier than the one before. Brittle lodgepole pines going up in an orange flash, the ashy haze scratching the throat and tearing up the eyes, an assault on all the senses. 
The thing is, it also smells like breakfast in India, like my grandmother's old house. Chai simmering gently over wood-burning stoves, rotis licked by the flame. It looks like India, too, the sunlight filtering through smoke in the softest, warmest orange, the polluted haze of our shared smog, a pinkish glow I now know mostly through memory, rose-colored nostalgia, a sunrise that lasts through the whole day. Even now, as climate chaos crispens the landscape I call home, I can't help but soften at the smell of things coming undone. <sighs> Forgive me for loving a burning world. You see, I have no other world, and I have no other love. The thing is, I believe in life after death, not because I'm a little bit Buddhist or a little bit Hindu, but because I'm a little bit of an ecologist, so I can tell you that the seeds of a lodgepole pine are fire activated meaning that their cones are closed tightly with a resin that melts when exposed to the flame. Meaning they must burn in order to become. Meaning that encoded in their bodies is the anticipation of destruction, the understanding that something must end for new life to grow. That if fires are allowed to grow, to burn, they will clear the understory so that young saplings have room to root, churn nutrients back into the soil, make space for life to cycle over itself. The thing is, life doesn't always move just in cycles. Sometimes it moves in spirals. The thing is, we can't talk about fire in the American West without talking about fear, about how for the last century or so, suppression was the settler law of the land. Smokey Bear, and his promise that only you can prevent forest fires. You see, that's how I knew he wasn't a real bear. If he was, he'd have been paying attention. He would have noticed native folks tending wildfires like a careful hearth for generations, would have watched the pine cones melt and crack open into fresh green every few decades, the entire ecosystem unfolding and stitching itself back together again, and the humans a crucial part of all of it. And maybe he would have said something else instead, like, why the hell are you trying to prevent forest fires in the first place? And what are you so afraid of? And what, you thought you were going to live forever? All that suppression, all that refusal to let things burn, it adds up. It lets kindling accumulate for generations, layers the forest floor in matchsticks, ready to boom in an instant blaze at the smallest spark, burn brighter, hotter, hungrier. Things always come back around, and nothing, and no one, can be suppressed forever. Did you know that the US military industrial complex is the largest institutional contributor to climate change? The US imperial war machine will burn and Palestine will be free. The US imperial war machine will burn and the Wilani forest in Atlanta will be free. The empires will burn and we will be free. The empires will burn and we will be free. The empires will burn and we will be free. There is an inevitability to fire. There is an inevitability to the seeds that emerge from the ashes. There is a responsibility there, too. What I'm saying is there must be a difference between the fire under the simmering stove of the slowly burning chai in Delhi and the fire that burned for a week in the valley last May and the fires that indigenous people light in the tall grasses of their homes that burn gently like the edges of a piece of paper and the fire that I use to light a cigarette on the rare impulsive occasion, spark in hand, and the fire that is burning somewhere else right now. But I think what they have in common might be a sense of responsibility both for destruction and also what comes after. Fire demands attention, and left untended becomes dangerous. Attention is not control. It is humility and curious attempts at understanding. Mary Oliver says attention is the beginning of devotion, and I think she's right. And I think that attention is probably part of the difference between fire starters and fire tenders. I think to tend fire, we must be tender. Er. What I'm saying is all I have are these two hands, and you have yours. And the fact of the matter is that we are capable of burning things, for better or for worse, and often for both. And we are left with what has been burned. And I like the smell of wildfires, the smell of things coming undone. It smells like breakfast. It looks like a sunrise that lasts all day. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Priya. That was beautiful. The next speaker I would like to um, announce is someone who's personally inspired me for many years. It's Laura Garber. Laura is well known in the bitter for her organization's contributions to the community. She founded Homestead Organics Farm when she moved to Hamilton in 1999. In 2015, she founded Cultivating Connections Farm Classroom. When she's not farming, she's often serving our community in many ways, including her facilitation skills and, re um, and recruiting high school students to deliver salads for the seniors through Meals on Wheels, a Cultivating Connections project. Please welcome to the stage, Laura. Thank you. I'm gonna start with passing this around. This is calendula, so please take a little bit of calendula in your hand. Um, it's gonna be part of your guide for my talk today. So thank you for having me. I am a farmer in Hamilton, I started farming I have cards today, sorry. This will be my 26 year farming. So I'm gonna start seeds on Thursday. And so Thursday will be my 26th time holding and loving and caring for and being so excited about the very first seeds of the season, which is a really exciting time. And I really just wanna share that to me, plants and nature are superheroes. They show us a path forward and they are our teachers. So I wanna share the ways that over the past 25 years, I've been taught by seeds and plants, and I hope that it will provide a path for you to remember the abundance and the resilience that lives with all, within all of us. And I want to start with seeds. So seeds are amazing. Seeds are the link to the past and our link to the future. Your great-grandmother grew seeds, and your great-great-granddaughter is going to grow seeds. And seeds are so exciting because the most important moment in seeds is now. You're holding the seed now, and if you have the opportunity to make the future happen or to let it die in your hands, and where, where else do we have the power of the future except in a seed? Seeds, open, open pollinated seeds, heirloom seeds, they're resilient and adaptable. They're these tiny little holding containers with this huge potential. I went to Sequoia National Park last year, and the cones of the sequoias are really small. And they grow these gigantic trees that live for thousands and thousands of years. It's amazing. And then the calendula seed that you have now in your hand, hopefully, is pretty big. It's pretty funky looking. And it grows this flower that will bloom and bloom and bloom all summer long and self-seed itself. And it's amazing to touch, to smell, to watch the bees on. So seeds have, they carry so much. Each tiny little carrying case is, is just a wonder. And again, seeds are history and future all at the same time. And you are the most important part of that. Seeds also teach us patience and to be vibrant and to try. But most importantly, seeds teach us to breathe. The seeds are actually respiring. We can't tell that the seed is breathing, but the seed is alive and it's breathing in time with nature and in time with the earth in a way that we can't see, but we can feel deeply in our bones. And so holding the seed is, re is the reminder to breathe. Are you breathing with earth? Are you in the world? Or are you of the world? So seeds are that reminder for us. They're also great metaphors. There's seeds of the future, and seeds of deception, and seeds of hope, and seeds of self-doubt. So I suggest you choose seeds of hope. So other things that plants and nature teach us. Plants are super resilient, and they teach us about resilience. So I want to share a little farmer trick. So when you're growing tomatoes and you've got this amazing crop of maybe heirloom tomatoes and now it's September 1st and they're not ripe yet and it's going to be cold and I've been watching them and they're beautiful, what do I do? So the trick is you go up to your tomato plant and first you say hi and then you go about a foot out from the base of that tomato plant, that stalk, and you're going to dig with your shovel about a foot down, about halfway around the stalk of the tomato plant. And it seems kind of violent. You're cutting the tomato plant, but really you're, you're causing stress. 
And that resilience that lives within the tomato plant feels the stress and immediately wants to ripen the tomatoes. And so you'll get ripe tomatoes from your tomatoes in September if you give it a little bit of stress, which I think is a really interesting parallel to nature that we can cause stress to nature, which we are, and nature can respond with its best try, it's give it it all. Just like the tomato plant, it's gonna ripen as much as it can because it really just wants to reproduce and ensure the next generation and succeed. That's the number one goal. And so stress equals resilience. And I feel like that's what happens in nature all the time. And that garden trick is just the reminder of we might be, we are stressing the earth and the earth is getting more and more resilient because of us. Doesn't mean we should keep stressing it. If you were to dig all the way around your tomato plant, it would just die. But just enough stress is gonna push it into, I can do it, I'm gonna be resilient, and I'm gonna bring you along the ride. Plants also teach us to try and to try again. So an example would be broccoli. If you've ever had broccoli in your garden, you pick the head, and then what do you know? It makes side shoots. It didn't get a chance to make the seeds. The broccoli floret is actually flowers that are gonna open up and make seeds. And so when you pick the broccoli head, it didn't get the chance. So it's gonna try and try again and it's gonna send out side shoots until it gets to have its seeds. So plants also teach us to collaborate. So here's a good example, sunflowers. We have been experimenting with sunflowers on our farm planting them in different areas of the farm in different directions and different numbers of plants to create some shade so that in August when it's really hot and the sunflowers are six feet tall, all the things that are on the east side of the sunflower get the afternoon shade. Or the other way around, things that like morning shade and afternoon sun. So sunflowers are teaching us to collaborate. And it's really cool, you have all these sunflowers planted around your farm and all the birds come to eat the sunflowers and what do you know, they fertilize your plants by pooping. <laughs> so another example of collaboration is probably you've heard of marigolds and tomatoes, that when you plant marigolds with your tomatoes, it keeps the nematodes from destroying your tomato plants. Or my favorite, corn beans and squash. So those plants collaborate in the most beautiful, harmonious way that they each use different things out of the soil and they each put back into the soil what their friend needs. So it's an example for us of how are we giving to each other in our communities in a way that's collaborative and everyone wins and everyone thrives. So plants also teach us to invite. Let's invite each other. Let's hold our hands out to each other. So an example, I love salad turnips. I don't know if you've ever had salad turnips. They're a, kind of a huge pain to grow because every maggot loves them. And so when you seed them, you have to cover them right away. And if you don't, you get maggots in your, in your turnips. But the kind of cool thing is the fly that landed, that laid that egg that was the maggot actually also pollinates other plants. So by inviting the pollinator, I'm also inviting other life. Um, there are also birds are invited by our plants. So a really good example, a couple years ago, we had just a horrible amount of cabbage moths. And if you've ever grown cabbage or broccoli or cauliflower, you've noticed these little white moths that get everywhere. And especially in the cabbage, if you ever buy a cabbage, uh, a local cabbage, sometimes there's like green slime in there. That's just the poop from the cabbage moth caterpillar. But you know what? The cabbage moths invite birds to the farm. And a few years ago, as we were standing outside at dusk, there was this huge swarm of nighthawks, which are beautiful, amazing birds. And they came and they swooped in and they ate all the cabbage moths. So they remind us to invite and to share with each other. And my favorite story about invitation is last year at our farm, we had we have a lot of kids groups come to the farm and we had kindergartners out and I had all of our onion starts in the greenhouse all along a really big table. And I invited the kindergartners to greet the onions and to maybe pet them a little. And so suddenly here's 25 kids running, walking along, petting the onions and suddenly spontaneously, I love you, I love you. You're beautiful, you're gonna taste so good. My mom loves onions, thank you. Then this just came from the kindergartners from nowhere. It makes me feel teary just thinking about it. It was the most beautiful thing. 
And it happened four times. Every class we brought in, they spontaneously did the same thing. Plants, they teach us to share. So plants cross-pollinate with each other. They share genetics, they share traits. Peppers are pretty cool. You know the trait that they most easily share is the hotness. And so you can have amazing, beautiful, sweet peppers over here, and then your super hot habanero peppers or whatever over there. And they're, they might cross-pollinate, and it's not like you're going to get a bell pepper that suddenly looks like a habanero pepper. You're going to get a bell pepper that's going to make you like <laughs> drool excessively. <laughs> so plants share, sometimes for good and sometimes to remind us to take a smaller bite. Then there's legumes. We all know that legumes, they fix nitrogen, and so they're providing for the rest of the ecosystem part of what they really need. And then there's tree roots, of course. The trees connect us through the worldwide wood. And so when we touch a tree, this is what I like to do, is approach the tree and say hello and ask it if we can co-create together. And I always hear immediately in my head and in my heart, yes. And the tree wants to create a beautiful world together. And I'm immediately connected with all the trees in the world. And I can ask that tree to send love to another, like to the tree in my parents' backyard or to the, to the sequoia that I met. And I know I'm connected to everything in the world through the trees and they're connected to each other. So plants also teach us to celebrate and to make the most of it. Things bloom and blossom and burst forth, and we can go out into the garden and be excited about the beauty that's constantly there. So it's reminding us to celebrate. And plants are reminding us to think of the future, too. The seeds that are the future in your hands and the past at the same time, and the something that your great-great-grandchild is going to eat or not, or the thing that your great-great-grandmother brought from wherever she lived in her pocket, sewed it into her dress, and carried it across the country, and then grew it, so now you get to hold it. So seeds remind us to think of the future and the tomato trick. Those tomatoes are thinking of the future. They know that if they're not able to be successful and to be resilient, there won't be tomatoes to share. Plants and seeds, they teach us to be inspired, and they are inspiring. There's a huge amount of diversity. There's brilliance in plants and nature. There's beauty everywhere. Resilience in every turn and abundance. Nature is abundant. Plants are abundant. Your, your garden is abundant. Even if the things that you're growing don't grow like you were hoping they were going to grow, there's always something to be excited about. There's something to be proud of. And there's something to be in awe of. And nature is giving her all. And I hope that's an inspiration for you. It's an inspiration for me. I look at the world and I know that there's all these human effects that are happening, but yet nature is still ripening the tomatoes, still producing the seeds, still using all that, it, all that she can to give us all she has. So let's be inspired by nature. And take nature's abundance as the story of our new opening into the world. And I'm almost done. So na it's, nature inspires us to try everything we can and to work together and to share and to breathe and breathe in time with the earth and to try and try again and to celebrate and to have the idea of everyone grows food, everyone eats real food. And my favorite idea is this idea of do the beautiful. Nature does the beautiful over and over and over again. Plants in the gardens do the beautiful. Rumi says, let the beauty you love be what you do. So let the beauty you love be what you do. Well, I love nature and I love plants. And so I want to do and be like nature and plants. I want to plant and I want to water it and I want to cook it and eat it and share it and seed it and save it. And I hope you do too. So I hope we can all show up as this expression of abundance, of amazing abundance that nature offers us. So we can confront what needs to go, and we can find robust solutions, and we can be a part of the story of resilience. And what we grow, and what we eat, and what we buy, 
is resilience. So are you in? Thank you. Thank you for that, Laura. Um, my name is Nick Wethington, and I'm the associate director of the Spectrum Discovery Area. Um, and I'm just giving you a little sneak peek of what you can see uh, downstairs in our museum. Uh, we, as part of our Resilience MT exhibition, uh, created some signage around nature's superpowers uh, and just how uh, resilient different organisms uh, in nature can be. Uh, so we have a flip panel display down in the museum. Um, Priya mentioned serotonous cones. That's one of my favorites. I actually picked up the serotonous cones that are down uh, in that sign on a hiking glacier. Um, so it was a joy to build um, because part of that building was picking off pine crowns from off the ground. Um, and we have, you know, examples uh, from the exhibit include the ability of lodgepole pines to bounce back after fire, but also how bison can tolerate drought conditions uh, and just how amazing tardigrades are. Um, I had a really wonderful conversation with a kid in the museum about how tardigrades can go into space, uh, and they're resilient in that way. When the exhibit travels, uh, we have a, a marker board up that's magnetic, uh, and we have a, a sign at the top of it um, prompting kids to share their own thoughts and their ideas about uh, resilient new, uh, superpowers in nature. Um, and the prompt that we have for the kids to answer is uh, what creative ideas, inventions, or superpowers can you suggest for helping Montana communities uh, to become more resilient to a changing climate? Uh, we've gotten a lot of really wonderful responses from uh, students down the Bitterroot. Uh, we're going to be traveling this exhibition to uh, Fort Belknap and Browning this spring, and we're excited to get their answers uh, to that question. And that will be up in the museum when, you're, when uh, we have a reception directly afterwards. So we invite you to share your ideas about that uh, right on a post-it note, stick it on there. We keep them all. We read them all. They're a joy to read. <laughs> Even the ones from middle schoolers that are inappropriate. Um, we love those ones, too. So, uh, Robin, I think you're next. I'm going to get you queued up here. Thank you, Nick. Um, he's done a spectacular job putting this exhibit together in Spectrum Discovery Area. So I hope you all can stay afterwards and come down and see the exhibit and check out some of these um, giant life-size uh, six-foot-tall signs that we've uh, constructed. Um, I'm Robin Saha. I'm a professor of environmental studies and um, am leading this uh, Resilience MT project. It's uh, um, a... Well, uh, to sum it up, and it's a whole bunch of stuff, but to sum it up really quickly, it's um, Montana communities telling, telling stories about resilience. And so as we think about how we do that, um, I should say, too, that um, resilience isn't the only thing we need to do. We also need to be stopping carbon we're pumping into the atmosphere. But um, as um, this inevitable change is happening around us. We also need strategies to be more resilient, and uh, there's a lot of wisdom in the communities that, uh, of resilience that's already going on, like we see in nature. And so uh, one of the uh, projects we uh, engaged on through this project was trying to um, figure out how communities could tell their own stories, and we decided to do that through a series of videos. And like Justin, um, I have no clue how to make a video. Well, maybe you don't either because you make audios. But, but in any case, um, I'm a social scientist. I'm a policy wonk. I'm trained in environmental sociology. Uh, but I said, OK, well, um, bring the smart people on board, right? So um, I brought a, um, a journalism graduate student on. Her name is uh, Josie Harris. And she produced a series of videos for us. And I learned a whole lot. And actually, I was the producer. So. Um, hoping I get some sort of award for that, but probably not. Um, and uh, what, what, we, uh, what you're going to be seeing is a, a video uh, from uh, uh, featuring a colleague and partner of us named Dennis Longknife, and he's um, a member of the F Fort Belknap Indian community. And uh, we were like, Dennis, we want to tell a story about resilience in your community. What, do, what should we talk about? And he like rattled off 16 different things. We're like, whoa, okay. Um, so 
the first thing we did then is, and I learned this from Josie, I learned a lot, and for students, you know, uh, here's a lesson. You can just jump into something, try it out, make sure you have some smart people around you like Josie. And so we, we interviewed him on a Zoom. We went up there. She took what's called B-roll. Is that right? B-roll? Any journalism? Yeah, B-roll. Yeah, okay. Um, it was in the winter, and uh, we interviewed him some more, and we, we went, went away from that, like, scratching our head, like, what the hell is this story going to be about? We got bison. We got a uh, forest restoration project. We got a grassland restoration project. We've got beavers. Beavers, yes, beavers. Uh, you might have seen it's a mascot for our um, for our project. So it came down to a story about beavers, and um, there's a story in a story. Dennis telling his story, and um, one story I'll tell about this is that we interviewed him. We went up there. It was a half an hour interview, and I was like approaching it like a social scientist, like, oh, we need to have very structured interview questions and get everything we wanted to know, and we and and we were interviewing a member of a tribal community, and that's just not how you do it. You have a, you know, you, you talk and you go around over here and over there and over there, and you just let it come out. And we were like, we got crap. This, this you know, all the footage we got is not going to work. And then we're like, okay, we're going to have to go back and re-interview him. And then Josie, like, looked at what we had, and she says, I think, we, I think it's going to work. And, well, you decide for yourself. We're going to show it here. We didn't do a second interview. Um, and so let us know how it turned out. It's about five minutes. One time when I was fishing with a friend down the valley, we heard a noise next to us. We knew it was a beaver. It was chewing on a huge cottonwood tree along the riverbank where we were fishing. All of a sudden, we heard that thing start cracking and creaking, and we looked up there, and that cottonwood tree was coming down. That beaver actually chewed enough of it away, the trunk away, where it came down crashing right next to us along the riverbank, and it, it sent us uh, running in both directions. <laughs> and after it came down, we kind of came back and were laughing to ourselves. Try? Every time I go fishing along the valley, I always see beavers. My name is Dennis Longknife Jr. I'm the climate change coordinator for the Fort Belknap Indian community. Our tribe is located in north central Montana, 34 miles from the Canadian border. So we got river valleys, prairie plains, and we got mountain foothills. Uh, we are fortunate to be living in the Milk River Valley. We've got a lot of beavers here. I think beavers are providing a really good service of creating these uh, beaver dams because they hold water for times when we need it. The past three years, we've been in a major severe drought. The main impacts were range fires, and we also had two fires in our mountains. Luckily, the fire never got into the communities. The bad thing about being in a drought is the prairie gra native grasses were so stunted in growth. Some of our cultural sites that used to be hidden by tall grasses were now exposed. We had a pretty good winter and a lot of snowpack. We also had a lot of precipitation. So we went into the spring with a lot of moisture and you can see it out on a landscape. It looked like Ireland outside. It was green everywhere, tall, lush grasses that were full of vigor. And now we're starting to get into our regular pattern, which is hot and dry. And not only that, we're getting the smoke from the Canada wildfires. Snake Butte is out in a distance about 10 miles from here, and on those bad days, we can't even see that butte out there anymore. And it is impacting our elders, because I've already been hearing from different ones that it really affects them. And they try not to breathe it, or they have to wear masks. In times of drought, 
livestock rely on uh, these beaver dam areas for their drinking water. The beavers around here mainly use willows and cottonwood trees and they make dams. It's just in their um, DNA to make them, I guess, but when they make these dams, they create uh, more water storage capacity that could be used f for later. Beavers provide a service by um, reducing the flooding effect from uh, heavy rains and they also filter the water, improving the water quality. When they're busy doing their thing, they're creating microsites for smaller organisms. They're opening the canopy for uh, other animals to access the riverbanks. They help control the population of the cottonwood trees, making it more healthy. In beaver habitat, uh, a lot of animals also uh, live harmoniously, I guess you could say, with them. But uh, yeah, the beavers do a lot of work. All right. So I, I shouldn't take too much credit, but I'm glad it turned out. It was a really stressful process, and um, Dennis did a, a great job. And um, he's he's such a um, a resource and 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 great person for the community. He's done just about every single natural resource job they have on the reservation, and. Um, I really appreciate him taking him around to these sites too. And as you could tell, we had a drone too. And so um, some of the drone footage, I think, really added to the um, spectacular beauty that you can see there uh, in the habitats. And um, it's a tremendous um, amount of area uh, that is, um, is really influenced by beavers on the reservation there. Um, that's not to say that they're not also affected by um, huge, um, uh, storms and extreme weather. He also took us to some sites where um, beaver dams had been washed out up in the mountains near the um, uh, near the Little Rockies, and um, so uh, they're also trying to uh, do restoration as well to places where the beaver have been um, been uh, uh, you know washed out. And, and try to restore habitats so they'll actually come back to these certain places. So there's, um, you know, this really delicate balance too that happens with uh, beavers on the landscape. Uh, a lot of the ranchers also don't like them because they can clog up irrigation canals. And so, you know, it's just a very um, a delicate relationship that people have to have to, to maintain, um, you know, to, for, to let the beaver do its thing basically. And um, and uh, um, so it was a great project. We have a couple other videos. I encourage you to check out our story maps as well, uh, where other community stories are told, including from the Bitterroot Valley. And uh, we're also working with the Blackfeet Nation. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Robin. When I was a little girl, my aunt taught me how to quilt. She told me the story as she had me a box of little pieces of fabric stacked inside. Each of these pieces of fabric holds a story. The cotton was grown by farmers, picked and packaged. It was then sent to a factory where many hands sorted and wove it into strong fabric. Somewhere at the same time, an artist in a city dreamed of a pattern to paint it with. And all over the world, pigments were harvested to make this artist's dream a reality. The fabric you now hold physically represents each person's journey and role. Each of them was needed to create this cloth. It could not exist without one of them. A quilt represents a multitude of stories. We all feel isolated when we're aware of only our own. 
Sometimes we feel that we are the only ones experiencing hardships, but when we hear the stories of others experiencing similar things, that is when we feel less alone. It gives us the chance to be braver. It gives us the strength to work towards change. And when we rise up together as a community, we can nurture each other and we can become the quilts. I would like to invite each of you to find your thread in the cloth, your resilience, and find the ones that lie next to you so that we can be strong and together we can find a solution. Thank you so much to each of you for being here and witnessing each of our stories. Um, so when we were designing the Resilience MT exhibition, uh, we did some thinking about what the, the big idea of the exhibition might be. And that's basically the underlying thread that ties together all the like exhibits and signage and activities and the themes. Um, and our big idea is this, that Montana communities share stories of resilience and continue to build their toolboxes as they adapt to a changing climate. Um, sharing stories and creating a human connection to the real world impacts of a changing climate are baked into the exhibition and our efforts on this project. By showing students that there are people in communities around our state that are actively working in local solutions to a global problem, it allows them to see themselves as future problem solvers in those same roles. It's not just climate work, uh, scientists that are working to solve this problem, it's farmers and land managers and homeowners and beavers. Uh, as someone who spends most of my work days thinking about how to design experiences for the public to be inspired to learn more about the world around them, I've realized something. Um, the best experiences either tell a story themselves or allow a visitor to share their own. Uh, we hope that Resilience MT does a bit of both, and we're excited to invite you to Spectrum's Museum on the second uh, floor. We're like two floors straight down on this side of the building. Uh, we have the Resilience MT exhibition in our museum, as well as food. We don't always have food, just for you. Uh, we're open 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday, and it's free to come check out the exhibition. And it will be here through uh, the end of March. So if you want to bring somebody back to take a look at it or check out some other activities at our Discovery Bench, you're, all, you're welcome to do that during our open hours. Uh, but right now, I'd love to have you all come down and eat some sandwiches, because we got a lot of sandwiches.